I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. You know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything. Everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. I personally am not writing every word of the novels. I am not animating the films. What I have to do now is make sure that the people that we bring in, these obsessives that we bring in, are challenging themselves to do the best job that they think they can do. That's what I'm there for, is for them to constantly look in the mirror and self-assess and challenge themselves. If we have a project and you're saying, okay, I can do that, that's not the project we want. The projects that say, I don't know if I can animate that. I don't know how to write that story. I don't know how to do that. Those are the things we want because through that curiosity, you'll reach a level that you didn't think was possible. In, at 13 years old, you know, I played the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13. It was to be better than you when you know, the chips are really on, on the line. So when you played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it? Right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths. I'd play to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you going to get better? Right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths. Why? Because you want to win. Right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game. Right? So I have a strategy. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17 and my game is completely well rounded and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17. Mm, now you got a problem. You know, in the NBA, <clears throat> it was actually easier because what I found in the NBA is a lot of guys played for financial stability. And when they came to the NBA, they got that financial stability. So therefore, the passion and the work ethic and the, obsession, the obsessiveness was gone. And, and then you had the players that had that passion, but weren't willing to commit their entire lives to doing that, right? It's a choice, right? You have other things. You have family. You have all these other things that you have to do. The game can't really be your number one priority. And the people that love you, like friends and family, like they know that about you. Got it. So they let you be you. And when you reconvene, you know, you pick back up where you left off. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake about it, everything in between is lost, right? So those long-term relationships, the commitment of time of, uh, you know, uh, like I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends. And oh, just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out. Like, I, I, I'm not, I never did that. Nobody in this history of coaching had your level of work ethic. I mean, you hear so many, William, so many guys tell stories about your work ethic. Yeah. What was really your work ethic like and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean, I mean, every day, I mean, since you know, 20 years, I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Now, my vertical was a 40, it wasn't a 46 or a mm -hmm. 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive, right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them so your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast, right? So I had to 
rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it though. So like from the time I was, I can remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game mm. and it just never changed. Who would Shaq be if he had your work ethic? He'd be the greatest of all time. For sure. I mean, this guy was a, a force like I have never seen. I mean, it was crazy. You know, a guy at that size, generally guys at that size are a little timid and they don't want to be tall. They don't want to be big. Man, this dude was, he did not care. He was mean. He was nasty. He was competitive. He was vindictive. I mean, he was, yeah. I wish he was in a gym. I would have had 12 rings. This message is directed to a lot of you, so hear me out very simply. The fact that you say the work ethic side, yeah. the fact that you say work ethic side, and you say, hey, if he would have wor worked as hard as I did, do you think if he would have had the same level of commitment to the game as you did, you guys would have had fewer feuds between each other? Yeah, because I, I, listen, I don't, I don't deal with people that don't commit at that level, but then act as if they do. I don't deal with that. I don't. Did you have ways to improve your game by looking at data, looking at conditioning? What were some of the factors you looked at on how to improve your game season after season? Uh, the game itself was, it, it's, a, it's a complicated answer. So there, there are very tactical things in terms of footwork and geometry of the court. So you're looking at the court and looking at the 45 degree angles that the court is, is shaped in and how it needs to operate. That's one component to it. So looking at spots on the floor where you can increase your efficiency. Right? You can be on the wing, but there's a certain spot on the wing that improves your angle to drive to the basket. Right? So that sort of stuff. Footwork of the opposition, looking at the emotion of the opposition, their tendencies, their weaknesses and all that stuff. Understanding the momentum of the game how to create momentum shifts, where momentum shifts come from, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then studying outside of that, right? Looking at different industries, looking at uh, conductors, looking at writers, looking at actors and how they get into character and then how do they keep themselves in that mental space. So um, looking at different, different industries, looking at nature itself mm -hmm. and learning from that and how you can incorporate that into the game. It, I, I, man, it's, it's a lot of studying. What's your process for making a decision? Do you have a flow of how you go through making a decision? Uh, depends on the decision. Depends on the decision. If we're talking about, you know, a basketball decision where, you know, you've got to um, you know, read a certain coverage or something like that, I mean, a lot of that comes from the pre-work. The pre-work pre and understanding what their defensive package is and uh, how to put teammates in certain situations. So, for example, if you look at players nowadays that are charged with taking game-winning shots, making game-winning decisions. Mm -hmm. And you look at the play, and then you look at it and say, okay, well, that shooter was there, the double team came, and, you know, the player couldn't do anything but pass the ball, right? Well, that's because they didn't do the pre-work, right? So when you do the pre-work, you understand, okay, this team in a situation likes to run a double team from this particular angle. All right, so I'm gonna clear that side out force the double team to come from a different angle, move myself to a space on the floor where it's going to take a long time for the double team to come, and now I can circumvent the double team and get to a place on the floor where I can knock down a shot and get to the basket. So it's, it's all that pre-work. Decision, when I say decision, how is the, if you're looking at somebody that you're sizing up, or if you're looking at somebody to go into business with, or if you're looking at a big investments you got to make. What is the decision making process there? Do you call, is there, first you do your own research, you take this much time, you call an advisor, is there, is there a system you no, follow? It's pretty, pretty simple for me, it's, it's do you understand the business? Is it a business that you can help in some form or fashion? What are the barriers of entry to that business? And then the entrepreneurs themselves, the company that, itself, right? do they have a culture that you believe is sustainable? Are these leaders people that you believe in? Are they people that are obsessives? And in turn, have they created a culture of obsessiveness? So I tend to look at those four factors and that's it. It's a long, long yes. process. But like, when I, I went in the trainer's room, my kids are in there, 
and you know they're looking at you and stuff and I'm looking at them and I'm like you know it's all right dad's gonna be all right we'll be fine we'll be all right we'll be all right we'll be all right as a parent you gotta set the example you gotta set the example this this is another obstacle this obstacle cannot define me it's not going to cripple me it's not going to be responsible for me stepping away for the game that I love I'm going to step away on my own terms and that's when the decision was made that you know what I'm doing it